Part 1. Intention. In this little book of personal stories and short essays, I share some of the connections I've made between yoga and psychedelics, particularly ayahuasca, the revered plant medicine of the Amazon. While the suggestions and reflections that I present here could be applied to any psychedelic that one utilizes for self-knowledge and healing, I focus on ayahuasca for two reasons. First, it's the psychedelic that's been the most helpful to me personally, and second, it's one of the few psychedelics that is part of a living tradition which, like yoga, employs a full spectrum of holistic practices for healing the body, mind, and heart. Through the interweaving of a consistent daily yoga practice and dozens of ayahuasca ceremonies, I began to see the connections between the path of yoga and the intentional use of psychedelics. In my ongoing exploration, I found that yoga offers both a useful context for understanding the psychedelic experience, as well as a set of practices that can help someone prepare for, navigate, and integrate what can often be a confusing and ungrounding experience. Yoga and the use of psychedelics have been completely compatible and complementary practices in my own life, but I want to state up front that I don't think that psychedelics are for everyone. They're certainly not necessary for healing or gaining a deeper understanding of yoga. This book is for people who are currently working with, or considering working with, ayahuasca or other psychedelics, and are curious about how a yoga practice can support that work and ultimately allow them to become less dependent on substances for their healing and transformation. From the psychedelic perspective, I've found that a consistent, dedicated yoga practice provides the stability and grounding that someone, especially a Westerner or gringo, needs to safely work with a powerful substance like ayahuasca. From the yoga perspective, it's been my experience that psychedelics can help the sincere practitioner more quickly clear out energetic and emotional blockages, enhance awareness of the more subtle aspects of their body-mind, move beyond the superficial expression of yoga that is so prevalent in the West, and ultimately attain the clarity, intimate self-knowledge, and feeling of interconnectedness that is the real heart of yoga. In regards to terminology, people refer to psychedelics in a variety of ways, as sacraments, sacred plants, entheogens, etc. I prefer the term psychedelic when speaking generally about these substances, but will use other terms interchangeably depending on the context. When talking specifically about ayahuasca, I think the term plant medicine is most appropriate because ayahuasca, unlike most of the other psychedelics, has medicinal qualities beyond the obvious psychotropic effects, most famously as a purgative and antiparasitic. There is research being done on ayahuasca as a treatment for cancer, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's diseases, which looks promising. In addition to ayahuasca, over the past 30 years, I've experimented with other psychedelics, such as psilocybin mushrooms, LSD, and MDMA, ecstasy, with mixed results. Much has been written about the set and setting in which we engage with these substances, and I would agree that being well prepared and taking them in a safe, intentional container produces the most positive results. This is probably why ayahuasca, which I have only ever done in guided ceremonies, has had the most profound impact on my life, more so than the other psychedelics which I've mostly done in a recreational context. That said, I don't think that it's always necessary to take psychedelics as part of an elaborate ceremony. I've had some very healing and enlightening experiences with MDMA and magic mushrooms, sitting around a campfire, or at home alone with my dogs, and some good music. The factor common to every beneficial experience was that I went into it with a clear intention to learn and heal. Initially, I considered organizing the stories and essays in this book around the stages of preparation, ceremony, and integration, but really, I see the whole journey as an integrated process. The initial call to work with psychedelics is a response to something happening in your life, whether it's something you feel you're missing, something that needs healing, 
or something you need guidance on. Reflecting on why you're doing it and what you hope to get out of the experience will help you hone in on your intention. Your intention can take the form of a prayer or request that is specific to a particular issue you'd like to resolve, or you can keep it more general, like, help me see what I need to see. Often we don't know exactly what it is we need to do in order to improve our lives. If we did, we wouldn't need to use psychedelics to find out. Refining your intention into a short phrase will provide you with a contemplative focus that you can return to during the experience. The insights you receive in ceremony will hopefully answer the question of how you're going to fulfill your intention. If it's not totally clear what you need to do, then having someone to talk to and process your experience with can be helpful at this stage. Keeping your intention alive through a daily practice of self-reflection and taking action on the guidance you received brings the journey full circle. If self-knowledge and connecting to something deeper within is what you're looking for, you don't need to wait for the opportunity to take psychedelics in order to do that. You can start today, and I hope this book offers some useful pointers for how to bring more self-reflection and soulful practice into your everyday life, with or without psychedelics. The fact that you're reading this right now means that you've already started on your path. While the organization of the text does loosely follow the thread of my own inquiry, feel free to jump in at any point that interests you. Different ideas may resonate at different times on your personal journey. I believe that yoga and the use of psychedelics are two paths with the same goal that cross over and intertwine at various points, each complementing the other in service to personal healing, growth, and transformation. I hope that anyone interested in exploring these ancient ways will find this book helpful. Part 2. Coming Home to the Heart The first time I drank ayahuasca, I was desperate. I was in my mid-thirties, working as a designer at a big advertising agency in Toronto. A few years earlier, I had married my soulmate, Debbie, and together we'd bought and fixed up a sweet little house in a quiet immigrant neighborhood just outside of downtown. We had a new car in the driveway and a new puppy in the backyard. From the outside, life was looking pretty good. In reality, I was struggling to keep it together. I had achieved all the markers of material success, but inside I was a total mess. I was stressed out, suffering from panic attacks and insomnia, and drinking every night to self-medicate. I exercised intensely, training kickboxing and taking yoga classes to help manage the anxiety and stress, but I was still waking up in the middle of the night, soaked in sweat, sometimes shouting or lashing out in my sleep. It got so bad that I started sleeping alone in our spare bedroom. I was feeling more and more distant from Debbie, and my frequent outbursts of anger and frustration were starting to wear us both down. I didn't know why I was so angry and stressed, or what I could do about it, but I knew I couldn't keep going on like that. So I did something that was unprecedented in my blue-collar, working-class family. I decided to find a therapist. One day, while sitting in my office, I typed the words Shamanism Therapy Toronto into Google. I didn't think much about what kind of therapist I was looking for, and I had no idea if there was even such a thing as shamanic therapy. But when it came time for me to seek help, that's what my fingers typed. Looking back now, a decade later, I can see that something deep inside me knew that I would find help through shamanism. At the time, I had no idea just how far my search would lead me down that path. I found the website of a counselor who worked with dream analysis and blended aspects of shamanism into his approach. It sounded perfect. Plus, he was renting an office close by and worked on a sliding scale. I made an appointment that day and went to see him the next week. It was incredibly helpful to have someone to talk to who I could be completely open and vulnerable with, and I found the dream analysis engaging and illuminating. My soul started speaking to me through the symbols of my dreams, which, when we unpack them, 
pointed toward early childhood trauma as the source of my anger, stress, and anxiety. I was getting a sense of why I was the way I was, but I still wasn't clear on how I could change. After working with Robert for about six months, he asked me if I'd ever heard of ayahuasca. I had, but hadn't thought about it in a long time. The first time I'd heard of ayahuasca was back in my late teens when I read William Burroughs' Yahe Letters. At the time, his accounts of drinking this powerful hallucinogenic brew from South America both fascinated and terrified me. I hadn't given it much thought since then, but when Robert told me about the Santo Daime, an ayahuasca church that began in Brazil about a hundred years ago and had since spread across the globe, it intrigued me. He belonged to the local chapter and said that he could arrange for me to participate in a ceremony if I wanted. That night, he sent me a link to a YouTube clip from a Brazilian TV show about the Santo Daime that included footage from one of their ceremonies. It showed a group of people dressed in white, singing hymns in Portuguese, shaking rattles, and dancing around a star-shaped altar with a cross in the middle. The whole church vibe seemed a little strange to me, maybe even a bit cultish, but at this point I was ready to try anything. At the very least, it seemed like a safe environment to drink ayahuasca for the first time. I was terribly afraid of what might happen if I lost control, but my desperation outweighed my fear. And as it turns out, losing control was exactly what I needed. A week later, we drove about an hour outside the city to the yurt where the ceremony would be taking place. I went into it not really knowing what to expect, but what I'd heard made me nervous. Ayahuasca was supposed to be the most powerful psychedelic in the world, famous for making people relive their worst traumas, causing them to vomit all night, and even lose control of their bowels. Like I said, I was desperate. We hit a traffic jam on the way, so by the time we arrived, the ceremony had already started. Luckily, I didn't have time to reconsider the whole thing. We quietly slipped into the circle, found our places, and received our first glass of ayahuasca. The effects of the first cup reminded me of the mushroom trips I'd had. I experienced some visual distortion, a bit of giddiness, and heightened sensitivity. It felt familiar enough to calm my nerves. I tried to follow along with the singing as best I could, but the lyrics in the songbook were dancing around on the page, and the words were all in Portuguese. When a second serving was offered, I felt pretty confident about my ability to handle myself, so I decided to go for it. The man who was pouring the ayahuasca gave me a knowing look as he handed me a cup that was filled to the brim with the dark, murky tea. Within minutes of drinking it, I started to feel a power of a whole different magnitude coming on strong and fast. I remember thinking, oh boy, here we go. The inside of the yurt rapidly transformed into a dense tropical forest with dappled light and the sound of buzzing insects. The group singing sounded like it was suddenly coming from very far away. My ears started ringing and I felt my consciousness being sucked into a tunnel that seemed to terminate in the center of my brain. An instant later, I blacked out completely. Unknown to me at the time, I had flown out of my chair, hit my head on the hard floor, and been knocked unconscious. When I talked to people later, they said it looked like I was kicked out of my chair by someone or something. Eventually, I woke up, disoriented and confused, and slowly made my way back to the circle. I sat between two older, more experienced men who would offer me gentle guidance and support for the rest of the ceremony. A while later, we stood up and started doing a simple two-step dance, which, under the circumstances, proved to be a difficult task. Even when I'm completely sober, I have a hard time learning dance steps, so this was a real stretch. Wayne, the guy on my right, told me to watch his feet. When I watched his feet, I found I could synchronize my movements to his, get out of my head, and get into the rhythm of the music. We laughed a lot as I struggled to keep up with the incessant 3-4 waltz rhythm. When I started getting hung up on trying to sing the Portuguese hymns while reading the translations, 
Wayne said, just sing. And so I just sang. Hallelujah. Things were so much easier when I stopped trying so hard and just surrendered to the flow. When the effects of the ayahuasca were coming on strong again, the guy on my left, Tony, seemed to sense that I was having trouble. He leaned over and quietly said, Come back to your breath. Come back to your heart. I'd never heard anyone talk about the heart in that way. I followed his advice and put my attention on my chest and breathed deeply. It was a revelation. It gave me a sense of being centered and anchored to something stable inside myself. I felt like I'd found a peaceful home in my body. My mind quieted down, and I gave up struggling to get everything right. I was finally able to relax and open up to the experience. I remember feeling such joy and gratitude for the rest of the ceremony. Hours later, when I walked out of the yurt and looked up at the night sky full of stars, I started weeping. For the first time in a long time, I felt at peace with everything and happy to just be alive. It had taken a total annihilation of my ego and a complete loss of control, but I'd found my way back to myself. I'd come home to my heart and I vowed to never get lost again. Part 3. Coming Home to the Heart Again Many years later, I would hear Dr. Gabor Mate, an expert on addiction and trauma, talk about how the root cause of addiction is a disconnection from the true self. It's an idea that completely resonates with my experience. Since I was a teenager, I'd used alcohol, drugs, and intense exercise to deal with social anxiety, fear, and depression, pains that arose from my deep insecurity and lack of self-worth. These coping behaviors took me even further away from who I really was and how I really wanted to live. The more disconnected I felt, the worse the symptoms got. It was a vicious cycle that I was stuck in for years. When I had that experience of connecting to my heart and feeling at home in myself and the world, it seemed to resolve the core issue that was behind my substance use. After that ceremony, for the first time in at least 15 years, I didn't feel the urge to drink. So when people say that ayahuasca isn't a magic bullet, I say, that's true, but sometimes it is. While it gave me immediate relief from my addictive behaviors, it didn't give me instant enlightenment, as I was to learn through some hard lessons over the days and weeks that followed. After that first ceremony, I felt like I was cracked wide open. I fluctuated between moments of deep peace and joy, and intense frustration and bursts of anger. Before the ceremony, Debbie and I had decided to leave Toronto and move to the west coast where my family lives and where I'd spent a lot of time over the years. We sold our house, bought a VW camper van, and spent a couple months driving coast to coast across Canada with our two Boston Terriers, Kingston and Sweetie. Those three months in the van were an emotional roller coaster for me. At times I felt more out of control than ever. It was like everything inside of me had been shaken up, and all the fear and anxiety I'd been repressing over the years was bubbling up to the surface. I found myself flying into a rage whenever we got lost, blaming Debbie for not keeping an eye on the road signs and spending too much time on her phone, only to find out that she was tracking our progress on Google Maps. My anger clearly wasn't about her, and I still feel a twinge of shame when I remember those times. One night, camped out in a provincial park, I awoke to the van filling with smoke. I jumped out of bed in a panic to discover that the bundle of sage Debbie had lit earlier had been smoldering away all night and was now burning the curtains. I lost it, cursing at Debbie for not making sure it was out before we went to sleep. The irony isn't lost on me that my anger was triggered by a plant traditionally used to clear negative energy. It was apparent that one ceremony hadn't exercised all my demons and my overblown reactions to the normal stresses of van life were letting me know that I clearly wasn't done with my healing work. Looking back, 
I think we are pretty crazy to take on so much all at once. I certainly wouldn't recommend driving across Canada during the hot summer with your partner and dogs in a 20-year-old van that keeps breaking down as a good way to integrate your ayahuasca experience. It was a difficult time for Debbie and me, but I've always felt that we had a kind of soul agreement to help each other heal and grow in this lifetime. We were in it for the long haul, and that trip was certainly a good test of our commitment to each other. Two months later, we landed on Vancouver Island with a sigh of relief. We were a little worse for wear, but we'd made it. After a decade or so of living in the big city and running the rat race, we were looking forward to settling into a quieter and simpler life. We rented a converted barn on four acres out in the country, surrounded by giant cedar trees. It had a workshop where I could do woodworking and a large fenced-in garden plot where Debbie could grow food and herbs. We had some money left over from our house sale, which allowed us time to focus on establishing our new life and cultivating a healthier lifestyle. Right away, I committed to a daily yoga practice, which was stabilizing and grounding after our time on the road. I began learning a vigorous form of yoga called Ashtanga Vinyasa and fell in love with its rhythmic flow and intensity. Within a month or two, I lost 25 pounds that I didn't even know I had to lose. I'd been practicing yoga on and off for about 15 years, but had never really done it with much intention or focus. Now that I'd found a method that I enjoyed and was feeling the benefits, I really got into it. I signed up for a teacher training at a local studio that specialized in Ashtanga yoga, and for the next four or five months, I'd go every morning at 6 a.m. to practice with my teacher, Deborah. I started reading the Yoga Sutras, studying anatomy and philosophy, and blogging about my experience. At the same time, I'd found a Santo Daimi church in Seattle, and was going there every couple of months for more ceremonies. It was an incredibly rich time of introspection and transformation. When I finished my yoga training, I began teaching classes at the studio and helping out with marketing and promotion. I loved teaching and found that I had a real knack for it. My years of playing live music had prepared me well for being at the front of the room, which is kind of like being on stage. My sense of humor and playfulness made my classes fun and accessible to a wide range of people. It felt great to share something that was helping me become a more calm, healthy, and sane person. My continued work with ayahuasca was quickly opening me up to the subtler aspects of yoga and teaching me a lot about energy, awareness, and concentration. And I found that yoga was teaching me a lot about how to work with ayahuasca. I felt that my regular practice was helping me develop what they call firmeza in the central daimi. It refers to the ability to stay grounded, centered, and firm when things get challenging. My daimi friends even began calling me a firmado. I felt honored and proud of how far I'd come since falling out of my chair in that first ceremony. And I was noticing that I could be more open, present, and loving with Debbie, which was the real test of all my work. After a year or so of teaching at the studio, I felt the call to dive deeper into my yoga studies. I wanted to find a teacher with more experience and a stronger connection to the lineage of Krishnamacharya, who is considered the father of modern yoga and the root teacher of the method I was practicing. My search led me in a roundabout way to an online video of a workshop with Mark Whitwell, a New Zealander who had studied directly with Krishnamacharya's son, TKV Desikachar, for many years. As I watched the video alone in my yoga room one morning, the sincere and relatable way Mark spoke about yoga really hit home. And he was funny, too. Right away, I had a clear sense that this guy was going to be my teacher. Mark talked a lot about the heart and the importance of the breath, and how yoga is really all about intimacy with body, breath, and relationship, in that order. After his talk, he led a short and simple practice that I followed along with at home. He kept reminding us to come back to your breath and come back to your heart, the same suggestions that Tony gave me in my first ayahuasca ceremony. At the end of the practice, I stood there in my yoga room, my hands together in front of my heart, and I wept, 
just as I did a year ago on that magical night under the stars. It was the second time I had the experience of coming home to myself. This time, all I needed was my breath to take me there. In that instant, I had a profound realization that yoga and ayahuasca were both paths to the heart, and that deepening my relationship to myself was the first step to deepening all my relationships. That was all I really wanted, to live deeply, love deeply, and laugh deeply with all my heart. I was excited to find that yoga could get me to the same place that I touched in my ayahuasca ceremonies. I decided that I needed to study with Mark in person whenever I could to learn more about the heart of yoga and how to share it with others. Part 4. The Healing Power of Relationship Over the next few years, I became a close friend and student of Mark Whitwell, traveling with him and assisting on retreats in California and China. In that time, I learned about the real heart of yoga, which is beautifully summed up in this quote by his teacher, TKV Desikachar. The success of yoga does not lie in the ability to perform postures, but in how it positively changes the way we live our life and our relationships. Being with Mark and seeing how he met each student with unconditional love and acceptance inspired me to keep working on myself. One consequence of hanging out with someone who is so clear is that you see all the places where you're not clear. In contrast to Mark's steady, calm, and loving presence, my judgments, criticism, and reactivity stood out like a sore thumb. As Mark was fond of saying, love brings up all that is unloved. Even when these unclear aspects of myself surfaced in our groups and caused conflict, Mark never admonished or shamed me. When I told him about my work with ayahuasca, he offered only that he thought that it's best done in the context of an ongoing yoga practice. The unconditional love and acceptance I got from Mark, someone who I respected and trusted, helped me to love and accept myself more and more. When I'd return home after a retreat, I'd miss being with Mark and wish that I lived closer to him, because when we were together, I felt how healing that relationship was. What I did have close by was the Santo Daime Church, so I kept attending every few months. At one point, when I was really missing my teacher, I went in a ceremony with the question, can a plant be a teacher? The answer I received was, of course. And I began to see how my relationship with ayahuasca was a lot like the relationship to my teacher Mark. Both relationships acted like clear mirrors that revealed all the parts of me that were unhealed and still causing pain and suffering. At the same time, they also brought out the deep love, compassion, joy, and gratitude that I've come to know as my essence. The big lesson I learned in this time is that the unconditional love and acceptance I felt from both teachers allowed me to see that even with all my perceived flaws, essentially everything's okay and I'm okay. Even though we all have our issues that sometimes work against us getting what we want, fundamentally we're all looking for the same thing, to love and be loved. And because we are wounded in relationship, we can only fully heal the wounds of the heart in actual relationship, starting with the relationship we have with ourself. I learned that it's only when I love and accept myself for who I am that I can love and accept others for who they are and open up the possibility for both of us to heal. Part 5. Psychedelics in Yoga The mystic powers arise due to auspicious birth, sacred plants, mantras, austerities, and samadhi. Yoga Sutra 4.1 my intention with this book is not to graft ayahuasca or psychedelics onto the tradition of yoga as another limb. Rather, I wish to illuminate and bring forward an aspect of yoga that's been there from the beginning, but has been largely suppressed due to cultural puritanism in both India and the West. 
Plant medicines have always been considered a valid method for healing and self-realization within the yoga tradition, and because of this, I feel that yoga offers the perfect context for working with psychedelics like ayahuasca. Likewise, psychedelics can be utilized by the sincere yogi to gain insight and help move the healing process along. The Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, circa 500 BCE, the most definitive and arguably most important text on yoga, says that siddhis, which are deep insights into the nature of reality, can be obtained not only through meditation, austerities, and chanting, but also through the use of medicinal plants, which Patanjali calls oshodhi. The term oshodhi refers to a plant or herb that is used to cure diseases of the body and mind and maintain physical, mental, and moral health. Digging into the etymology reveals that another quality of Oshodhi is to make known or to reveal something that is surprising. We could say that another word for Oshodhi is psychedelic, a term coined by Dr. Humphrey Osmond in the early 1950s to describe substances that reveal hidden aspects of the mind or psyche. So while the term Oshodhi is usually translated simply as herbs, it seems to point more specifically toward psychotropic plant medicines like ayahuasca. The Sanskrit root of Oshodhi is Osha, which means light-bearing, a term that draws yet another parallel to ayahuasca. The ayahuasca brew is traditionally made by combining two plants, the ayahuasca vine itself, Binisteriopsis kapi, and the DMT-containing chakruna leaf, Psychotria viridis, which the ayahuasqueros say brings light to the visions. The Santo Daimi tradition says that the vine is the force and the leaf is the light. Going back even further than the Yoga Sutra to the most ancient text of India, the Rig Veda, circa 1700 BCE, we find many descriptions of the use of Soma, a sacred drink concocted from plants that had curative and revelatory properties. Interestingly, the preparation of Soma involves pounding or crushing the stalks of a plant, similar to the preparation of the ayahuasca brew in which the tough, woody vine must be pounded before boiling to help extract the active alkaloids. Furthermore, like ayahuasca, Soma was both a healing medicine and a spiritual sacrament. In the Rig Veda, we also find references to Soma as a light bearer, which connects it to the Ashodhi mentioned in the Yoga Sutra. These passages from the Rig Veda describe the qualities of Soma as both a sacrament and a healing elixir. Pay reverence to King Soma, born the sovereign ruler of the plants. We have drunk Soma and become immortal. We have attained the light the gods discovered. These glorious drops that give me freedom have I drunk. Let the drops I drink preserve me from disease. Make me shine bright like fire produced by friction. Give us a clearer sight and make us better. Bruised by the pressed stones and extolled, Soma, thou goest to the sieve, giving the worshipper hero strength. This juice, bruised by the pressing stones and lauded, passes through the sieve, slayer of demons, through the fleece. Soma covers the naked and heals all who are sick. The blind man sees, the lame man steps forth. Let those who seek find what they seek. Let them receive the treasure. Let him find what was lost before. Let him push forward the man of truth. There has been much debate about the identity of the plants used to concoct Soma, but as Ayurvedic doctor and scholar Robert Svoboda says, People used to ask my teacher Vimalananda, where can we find the Soma that's mentioned in the Veda? And he used to say that you're never going to find Soma because you can only locate it if you are already immortal, because it's immortal already, so forget it. What you can do, though, is you can find something that is not Soma, but will have a similar effect inside you, and then you can use that 
It will not transform you the way that Soma does, so completely and totally, but if you work with that, it will progressively transform you as much as you can be transformed. For him, he used whiskey. For me, I like very much ayahuasca taken with some other things to alter the effect slightly. Different people have different things that they use. Some people will use cannabis, some people will use other substances. End quote. While at least one scholar has argued that soma could have been ayahuasca, or at least an ayahuasca analog, it is perhaps more accurate to say that ayahuasca can be soma, because in the right context and with the right intent, it can fulfill all the promises of that mythical elixir, clear insight, physical healing, divine knowledge, spiritual freedom, and a taste of immortality. For the yogi, using soma or another oshodhi is just one way to achieve these siddhis. It's worth noting that in the Yoga Sutra, the use of sacred plants is seen as a less preferable method than meditation, because ultimately, the goal of yoga is total freedom, and relying on a plant or other substance to achieve a state of well-being or gain spiritual insight is considered a hindrance. While a psychedelic can give us a temporary taste of the freedom that's possible, it can easily become just another way to escape reality and avoid dealing with the psychological issues that keep us from experiencing greater freedom on an ongoing basis. Part 6. Yoga is Psychedelic The word psychedelic was coined by British psychiatrist Humphrey Osmond in the 1950s when he was using LSD as part of his therapy with patients in a mental hospital in Saskatchewan, Canada. He found LSD especially effective in revealing the unconscious material that was at the root of his patient's suffering, whether that was due to mental illness or addiction. So it was from a psychological perspective that he coined the term psychedelic and defined it as mind manifesting. This aspect of psychedelics, the ability to step back and see our ego from a different perspective, is certainly beneficial if we hope to change our thinking or behavior. But if we look at the roots of the term, which combines the Greek words psyche and delos, it points to something much deeper. The original meaning of psyche is soul, and delos means to manifest or reveal. Knowing this, we can also understand psychedelic to mean soul revealing, which is more of a spiritual perspective. Yoga bridges the psychological and spiritual perspectives in that, initially, the practices of yoga teach us how to step back from the socially conditioned mind in order to observe it and understand how it is functioning or dysfunctioning. In this respect, yoga manifests or reveals the mind. Ultimately, though, the goal is not to change the mind, but to reveal what lies beyond the mind, the spiritual heart. When the path to the heart is open, the soul can speak and our direction in life is made clear. We can then, as Desikachar would say, make the heart the boss and the mind its dutiful attendant. Whether we define psychedelic as mind manifesting or soul revealing, yoga encompasses both aspects, which makes it much more than just another form of physical or psychological therapy. Yoga is holistic medicine for the mind, body, and soul. Because it is psychedelic, a sincere yoga sadhana provides an ideal context and support for working with ayahuasca and other psychedelics, and will extend and enhance their benefits long after the ceremony is over. Part 7. Trauma and Addiction Dr. Gabor Mate, a renowned expert on trauma and addiction, says that all addiction has its roots in trauma, either big T trauma like sexual or physical abuse, war, natural disaster, or the small t trauma we experience when we grow up with indifferent, depressed, neglectful, or stressed caregivers. 
He further explains that trauma is not the event that happens, rather, it's what happens in the individual on the level of the body and psyche as a result of the external event or environment. He says the effect of trauma is essentially a disconnection from ourself, our innate sense of wholeness and self-worth, our emotions, our body, which leads to a disconnection from the present moment and other people. This fundamental disconnection from what is whole and good within each of us can make it difficult or even painful to be present, open, and vulnerable with others. This can deprive us of nourishing intimacy. In an attempt to relieve that pain, people often look to substances and behaviors for temporary relief. It's completely natural and understandable to seek relief from pain and suffering, but relying on something external to feel alive and whole leads to unhealthy dependence and usually causes further pain and suffering. Both psychedelics and psychotherapy can reveal repressed aspects of the psyche and help connect the dots between the symptoms that one is experiencing in the present and the events of the past. This is an important piece of the puzzle in that it can be useful to understand the source of trauma and develop a personal narrative, but it's only the beginning of the healing journey. Just about every approach to healing trauma I've encountered focuses primarily on three aspects, embodiment through movement and awareness practices, self-regulation using the breath and positive visualization, and connecting to the present moment through mindfulness and meditation. A few years ago, I participated in a workshop with Dr. Mate, where he spoke at length about trauma and what's needed for someone to recover. As he listed all the various methods and approaches to trauma recovery that people like Peter Levine, Bessel van der Kolk, and Pat Ogden have developed over the years, I realized that yoga included each and every aspect. An image flashed in my mind's eye of a neon sign above the stage where Dr. Mate was speaking that proclaimed, Yoga is the therapy. Yoga, when it's adapted to the individual and engaged with an attitude of non-striving, compassion, and acceptance, is inherently therapeutic. A practice that combines movement, mindfulness, and simple breathing exercises is an effective treatment for post-traumatic stress because it's an integrated approach, and the end goal of trauma therapy is reintegration of the whole person, body, mind, and heart. The word healing means to make whole, and recovery from trauma is simply a remembering of the wholeness that is our natural state. The postures and breathing practices of yoga release the holding patterns of tension that are often formed in the body following a traumatic event. Similarly, they enliven the numbed areas that we've disconnected from as a coping mechanism. Over time, the breathing and meditative practices rewire the brain and nervous system to restore a natural state of harmony and stability. Engaging in a personalized yoga practice empowers the individual with tools for self-regulation that can be called on in times of distress. Together, the mind-body practices of yoga recover the connection to the whole self and present moment awareness that have been lost due to trauma. Also, If someone has already engaged in a regular yoga practice before taking psychedelics and has a more stable sense of their essence, the self beyond the mind, it will better prepare them for the experience of ego dissolution that can happen as a result of taking higher dose psychedelics. When someone doesn't have a connection to the deeper self, or even a concept of it, ego dissolution can be a frightening and confusing experience. Lastly, but perhaps most importantly, a relationship with a caring and compassionate teacher or yoga therapist is essential in that it creates the sense of safety and trust that's necessary for the person to fully process their experience and move through the stages of healing. The healing relationship with a teacher or therapist provides the safe space that was missing when the traumatic event originally happened and allows repressed emotions to emerge and be released without fear of judgment or shame.
Part 8. Trust the Healing Process One of the benefits and risks of both yoga and psychedelics is their ability to effect a profound release on every level of our system, which can cause us to feel more sensitive and open. Initially, this can be overwhelming, especially if we're not used to that degree of sensitivity and openness. In the beginning, it can often feel like things are getting worse, not better. What's happening is that we are becoming more attuned to our physical, energetic, and mental states, and repressed emotions are being released. These aren't new emotions. Rather, they are old emotions that have been bound up in the body and unconscious mind. Emotions are energy in motion, and trauma restricts their natural flow and release. When a big emotional release occurs suddenly, which can happen in a psychedelic experience, it's like opening a dam that's been holding back a river. The person can be flooded with an overwhelming torrent of emotions. Yoga offers an approach that removes physiological and psychological blockages gradually over an extended period. This allows the person time to become more and more comfortable experiencing emotions that have been previously repressed without feeling overwhelmed. This is key because an overwhelming experience can lead to re-traumatization and discourage the person from continuing therapeutic work. Peter Levine, in his Somatic Experiencing Method for Healing Trauma, calls this titration and uses the analogy of a beaker that releases fluid one drop at a time into a solution to avoid a sudden explosive reaction. The goal, ultimately, is to let the emotions flow and to allow the natural healing process to run its course through the stages of fear, anger, pain, and grief. As you go through these stages, you might find yourself feeling more reactive than usual, which is completely normal. A wound has been opened, and like any wound, it will be tender and need time to heal. So, create some space for the healing to happen. You might need to avoid people or situations that are triggering and make time to care for yourself, just like you would if you were recovering from a physical illness. It can be helpful to spend time in nature. No one was ever triggered by a tree, with your beloved pet, or with a friend who offers a calm, grounded presence. The important thing is to trust the process. Know that it's necessary to go through each of the stages of healing, and that attempting to transcend or numb any temporary discomfort will just repress what has been released, and you'll be back where you started. Be patient. Hold yourself and everything that comes up with compassion, and you'll find that on the other side of healing is greater strength and an increased capacity to be open and loving with yourself and with everyone you meet. Part 9. Get out of your head and into your heart. Some of the ayahuasca curanderos I've met have worked with thousands of Westerners, gringos, who come to them in search of healing and spiritual growth. When I meet them, I like to ask, what is the most common problem you see in the gringos you work with? Their reply is always a variation on the same answer. One curandero I met put it this way, gringos are easy to work with because their problem is simple. They read too much, they talk too much, they think too much, they live too much in their heads, not enough in their hearts. At the core of many spiritual traditions is the teaching that the heart is the home of our true nature and the source of wisdom, peace, love, and joy inside each of us. In our modern culture, the heart has lost its deeper spiritual meaning and been reduced to an emoticon we tap when we like a post or photo. We've lost our connection to the heart, so we end up looking for happiness and spiritual fulfillment outside of ourselves. It's a search that can seem endless. The answer is always over the next horizon, or in the next book, workshop, or online course. I found that the more I looked for peace outside myself, the more confused and frustrated I became. It wasn't until I met Mark that I realized that my seeking was the problem. 
He was always quoting his teacher, U.G. Krishnamurti, who told people who came to him looking for enlightenment that it was the very search for peace that is, quote, destroying the peace that is already there, unquote. It's a profound statement, and it took me a long time to actually get it. Why is it so hard to give up the search? U.G. said, The plain fact is that if you don't have a problem, you create one. If you don't have a problem, you don't feel that you are living. Consumerism has conditioned us to believe that we'll never be complete without the latest gadget, health fad, guru, or plant medicine to fill the void. Advertising and social media feed the fear that we're always missing something. Our longing to fill this heart-shaped hole has created a billion-dollar self-help industry that depends on keeping us dependent. It's an endless cycle fueled by a natural, age-old human desire to find some kind of peace and spiritual fulfillment in this life. So how can we get off the spiritual self-help merry-go-round? The Upanishads speak of the heart as the home of the soul. Indian saint Nisargadatta Maharaj said that if you want to know God, simply connect to the feeling of aliveness within yourself. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. Rumi says, your heart is the size of an ocean. Go find yourself in its hidden depths. The message of the saints and prophets is clear. Give up your search, look within, and find the peace that is already there. Get out of your head and into your heart. Part 10. What do I do in ceremony? I'm often asked by people new to ayahuasca for advice about what they should do in ceremony. Do I sit up? Is it okay to lie down? Do I follow the visions or focus on something else? When I've posed the question to some of the ayahuasqueros I've met, they always give the same answer. Sit up straight and concentrate. Essentially, their suggestion is that we meditate. They say that many of the issues they see in the gringos that come to them for healing are symptoms of the scattered mind and tendency to overthink that is endemic to the modern Western person. They feel that one of the ways ayahuasca can help is by developing the mental-emotional fortitude, what the Shipibo call kushishinan, needed to overcome those issues, whether they be depression, anxiety, or addiction. In addition to the simple advice of sit up straight and concentrate, I suggest that if you consider ayahuasca a plant teacher, then you should treat it just like you would any teacher that you respect. If you were with a human teacher that you wanted to learn from, would you sit up or lie down? Would you pay close attention or let your mind wander off on a fanciful journey? Would you listen closely or would you allow yourself to be distracted by what the person next to you is doing? If, on the other hand, you think that ayahuasca is simply a tool that helps you learn about yourself and tap into your inner wisdom, then the best way to use it would be to turn your attention inward, get quiet, and listen for what the Quakers call the still small voice inside, and what the yogis call pragna, or direct intuitive knowledge. Whether you think that the lessons come from the plant itself or that the plant helps us access the wisdom within, the key to any kind of learning is the ability to focus, observe, and listen. If you choose to take the advice of the maestros to sit up straight and concentrate, then a good way to prepare for ceremony would be the same as preparing for meditation. The posture and breathing practices of Hatha Yoga were designed specifically to create the optimal conditions for meditation. The asanas help to develop stability and ease in the body, and pranayama helps to quiet and clear the mind. Both practices teach you how to focus, stay present, and listen, skills which aren't just good for ceremony, but are good for all of life.
Part 11, Kriya Yoga, Yoga in Action Future suffering can be avoided. Yoga Sutra 2.16 In the Yoga Sutra, the sage Patanjali introduces two approaches you can take toward the ultimate goal of freedom and realization of your true self. Ashtanga Yoga, the eight-limbed path, which includes guidelines on ethics and practice, and Kriya Yoga, the yoga of action. While some may see these as separate, distinct approaches, Kriya Yoga is actually a part of Ashtanga Yoga, embedded in the Niyamas, or positive actions, regarding the self. Considered on its own, Kriya Yoga provides a useful framework that I feel is especially relevant for anyone working with ayahuasca or other psychedelics to aid in preparing for, processing, and integrating the experience. Kriya Yoga consists of three actions. They are Tapas, Svadhyaya, and Ishvara Pranidhana, or self-discipline, self-inquiry, and surrender. Together, they form the foundation of your sadhana, the means to achieve your desired goal. In this case, the goal is to integrate the psychedelic experience into our life and create lasting change. When I first encountered these actions, I was reminded of the famous serenity prayer from the Christian tradition. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Instead of simply praying for serenity, courage, and wisdom, Patanjali suggests a set of actions we can practice to grow these qualities within ourselves. Tapas cultivates courage and inner strength through self-discipline. Svadhyaya cultivates wisdom through self-inquiry and reflection. Ishvara Pranidhana cultivates serenity by surrendering to a higher power everything that we have no control over. Let's look at each action in more detail. Tapas or self-discipline. The word tapas refers to a kind of energy that comes through self-discipline. I think of it like the intense heat that's generated when you focus a magnifying glass to concentrate sunlight. Tapas can be any form of self-discipline that sharpens our focus and brings energy and intention to our spiritual practice. The typical ayahuasca dieta is a form of tapas where we abstain from alcohol, sex, drugs, and certain foods before and after an ayahuasca ceremony. In the modern context, tapas might also include a reduction in the consumption of online information and entertainment. Maintaining a daily yoga practice, eating in moderation, avoiding alcohol and recreational drugs, and reducing internet use would be a powerful tapas to prepare for a ceremony and support your ongoing healing and transformation. Svadhyaya or Self-Inquiry Traditionally, Svadhyaya was a form of self-reflection practiced through the reading and recitation of Vedic texts. Today, we have many ways to practice self-inquiry. We can read spiritual and self-help books, listen to podcasts with spiritual teachers, or work with a counselor, therapist, or life coach. I've found value in all of these methods and offer some reading recommendations in the back of this book. Another simple way to incorporate Svadhyaya into your life is to keep a regular journal where you can reflect on your experience, interactions, and dreams. Self-inquiry and reflection can be very helpful before working with psychedelics to get clear on your intention and equally helpful afterwards to integrate the lessons and insights you receive during your experience. As we increase awareness of our thoughts, speech, and actions, and their consequences, we reduce the tendency to react unconsciously to what other people say and do. We gradually become more able to respond to any situation with greater skillfulness. It's what the Bhagavad Gita means when it says, Yoga is skill in action.
Ishvara Pranidhana or Surrender. Ishvara Pranidhana is devotion and surrender to a higher power. Patanjali uses the term Ishvara, which is open to interpretation depending on the individual. Ishvara Pranidhana could mean dedicating the results of your practice to your chosen deity, the universe, Mother Earth, or for the benefit of all beings. The important thing is to choose something that is close to your heart. If it's a religious image, it will be more effective and appropriate to choose one from your own culture. The Bhagavad Gita has a saying that relates to the idea of surrender. You have the right to your actions, but not to the fruits of your actions. This is about recognizing that while we can't control the outcome of everything we do, we can and should always do our best with what we've got at the time, a view which cultivates humility, non-attachment, and acceptance. When practicing yoga or working with psychedelics, an attitude of humility and non-attachment can help us avoid ego inflation when we get what we want, or disappointment when we don't. Ishvara Pranidhana suggests that we go a step further and surrender the desires of our individual ego to a greater force, and trust and have faith in the intelligence and healing power of life. Life is always moving toward balance and wholeness, and all we really need to do, or can do, is support the healing process that is already and always happening. When working with psychedelics, this could mean going into ceremony with an attitude of openness, curiosity, and a nonspecific intention like, show me what I need to see, teach me what I need to learn, heal what needs to be healed. When we bring the qualities of humility, curiosity, and courage that Kriya Yoga cultivates into our everyday life, we begin to see that every situation we encounter and each person we meet has the potential to teach us something about ourselves. What we previously thought of as challenges or difficulties become opportunities for growth and transformation. Part 12 Integrating Yoga and Ayahuasca As I see it, there are two aspects of integrating the psychedelic experience. The first is staying connected to the sense of unity and wholeness that we experience in ceremony even after we return home. The second is taking action on the insights and guidance we received to create positive change in our life. The first aspect, connection, gives us the inspiration and energy for the second aspect, action. Both are essential to fully integrating and making the most of the psychedelic experience. When I do integration work with people, I strongly recommend developing a daily home yoga practice because it's the most effective tool I know for maintaining the energetic opening, mental clarity, and heart connection that we often experience following a good psychedelic ceremony. Yoga also helps keep your body strong and healthy so that you can do the work you're inspired to do and serve the greater good, manifesting change on the personal, community, and planetary levels. You gotta have some practice, otherwise it's just going to become a memory, and practice means daily, doing something that evokes something of that experience, connecting to what you saw there. Dr. Gabor Mate The Heart of Yoga The teacher of my teachers, Sri Tarumalaya Krishnamacharya, 1888-1989, recognized the evolving needs of modern people and developed an efficient and effective method called Vinyasa Yoga that integrates movement, conscious breathing, mindfulness, and meditation in a seamless practice. His teachings are based on the fundamental principle that yoga must respect and be adapted to the needs of the individual, making it an inherently trauma-sensitive, accessible, and inclusive approach. This feels especially relevant in today's world.
Just as the psychedelic experience is different for everyone, the daily yoga practice you take up should be unique to you, based on factors like your age, physical condition, cultural background, goals, and interests. Although everyone's practice may look different on the outside, when some essential principles of Hatha Yoga are integrated, it ensures that the practice will be safe, effective, and enjoyable. I share some of these principles in the practice section of this book. Through the breath and postural exercises, which are designed to balance our energy and reduce tension and stress, our mind becomes calm and clear. When the mind is quiet, that which lies beyond the mind, the spiritual heart, our true self, is revealed. Being connected to our heart allows us to relate and act from a place of equanimity, compassion, and care. This individual journey to one's true nature is the real heart of yoga. Ayahuasca is yoga. When I explained this approach to yoga to a Shipibo healer, he nodded, pointed to his chest, head, and the sky, and said, Ya! Yeah, yoga es concentración! Kushishinan! In Shipibo, Kushishinan means strong mind. The healer's gesture signified that the Shipibo, like the yogis and mystics of all traditions, recognize that our mind, heart, and source are all one. You could say that ayahuasca and yoga share a common goal, to heal and strengthen our body-mind so that we can recover this connection, and in doing so, recover the sense of wholeness and basic goodness that is our birthright. I participated in a yoga course for the first time, and that's made an enormous difference in my own transformation, more than, for me, drinking the plant has ever done. Plants are exciting and kind of sexy these days, but it's not the only way. Dr. Gabor Mate Yoga is integration. The discipline of maintaining a daily practice and the quality of attention we cultivate within the practice empower us with the clarity and energy to take appropriate action on the positive changes we want to make in our life. This can include changes to our diet and other lifestyle choices, the way we relate to ourselves and others, a career change, or finding ways to incorporate more creative expression in our life. Practicing in the morning is a great way to perform a daily comprehensive check-in with yourself on the physical, energetic, and mental emotional levels. It's an opportunity to ask, how am I doing today? And draw on that insight to guide your decisions for the rest of the day. I often recommend journaling as part of your yoga practice. Writing your thoughts and feelings down can help clarify them and perhaps give you some helpful perspective on whatever you're dealing with at the time. Reading spiritual books, listening to teachers you relate to, or studying the classic yoga texts can provide additional inspiration and useful insights. Other aspects that you might incorporate into your practice are prayer, chanting, building an altar, drawing or painting, listening to music, singing, or playing an instrument. Whatever helps you create a devotional, sacred mood will enrich your practice and ensure that it's fulfilling on every level. Your yoga practice is a way to bring ritual and ceremony into your everyday life, which can restore the sense of meaning and purpose that many people find lacking in our materialist culture. My goal when coaching folks who are working with ayahuasca or other psychedelics is to teach them how to practice yoga in a way that's right for them, not only as a support while in ceremony, but as a way to integrate the experience into their regular life. A daily practice allows you to stay engaged in the healing process and maintain a direct connection to the mystery, wonder, and magic of life as it is already and always arising in your body, breath, and relationships. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, the benefits of engaging in a consistent practice extend beyond your own personal well-being. 
by caring for your physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual needs, you are better able to care for others and be a force for healing in your family and community, which integrates your awakening to the sacredness of life into the fabric of the wider world. Part 13. Be Your Own Shaman Dr. Joe Tafur, an American medical doctor and co-founder of Peruvian Ayahuasca Healing Center Niwe Rao, relates that from the indigenous shamanic perspective, issues such as anxiety, depression, PTSD, addiction, autoimmune disease, and psychosomatic illness are caused by an accumulation of negative energies due to physical and emotional traumas, environmental toxins, poor diet, grief, sadness, anger, and related blockages. In the indigenous context, it's the healer's work to remove malas energias, bad energies, and oscuridad, darkness, through limpieza, cleaning, with diet, plant medicines, healing songs, and the other therapies that make up traditional Amazonian plant medicine. If not treated, these blocked energies result in illness. Dr. Tafur's teacher and resident master healer at Niwe Rao, Ricardo Amaringo, stresses that if we don't have a shaman to clean those blockages, over time they start to manifest as physical illness. The idea that disease is often a manifestation of deeper psycho-emotional issues is now widely accepted by Western medicine. Ricardo says that the work they do in the maloka, the ceremonial structure that acts as a sort of jungle hospital, is threefold. Limpiar, centrar, abrir, to clean, to center, to open. This approach is in alignment with the model of Hatha Yoga, where the initial focus is on clearing and purifying the physical and energetic bodies through postures and breath work. When blockages are removed, energy, prana, can then be balanced and stabilized, which supports overall health as well as making mental clarity and focus possible. This allows the practitioner to establish their awareness in the heart center, which opens them to an experience of unity, wholeness, joy, and unconditional love. Putting aside the traditional esoteric concepts of energy and purification, it's possible to feel for oneself how simple breathing practices and stretching can create a sense of relaxation and clarity almost immediately. It's not a big leap, then, to see how reducing physical and mental tension and stress would have a beneficial effect on health and healing. The problem for those of us living in a secular, materialist, consumer culture is that we've become disconnected from our own shamanic traditions and don't have someone to clean us out when we need it. Modern allopathic medicine doesn't have the answer for many of the physical, mental, and emotional illnesses that an increasing number of Westerners are suffering from, so we've started to look elsewhere for healing. Many people have found help in traveling to places like South America where shamanism is still actively practiced, but that's only an option if you can afford the time and expense to make the trip. Traveling to South America to participate in ayahuasca ceremonies with a curandero may be the best course of action in cases of physical, emotional, spiritual crises when other treatments have failed, but it's not a financially or ecologically feasible way to maintain one's mental and physical health long term. Besides, an over-reliance on something like ayahuasca tourism raises a myriad of other complex sociological and ecological issues. In the wake of growing interest in ayahuasca and other psychedelics, we're seeing a rise in related cases of abuse by predatory shamans, people who suffer psychotic breaks and post-psychedelic psychological issues, and even deaths due to misadventure, violence, and suicide. 
There are also issues around the sustainability of plant and animal sources of psychedelic compounds that are a growing concern. Considering all of these factors, it's imperative that we Westerners find some way to, in a sense, be our own shaman and take a proactive role in our ongoing health and healing. What makes yoga such a valuable gift is that it enables you to clear and center yourself on a daily basis, wherever you might be, with nothing more than a little space to move and sit comfortably. A simple practice goes a long way towards staying healthy and open to the fullness of life. Also, because shamanism and yoga work in much the same way, engaging in a regular personal yoga practice helps to integrate the peak experience of the plant medicine ceremony and bring the magic, mystery, and inspiration of the jungle into everyday life. All of this points to yoga as a valuable complement to any shamanic healing work, specifically because it is an ancient shamanic healing technology itself. Part 14. Awakening the Inner Te- In the modern world, we are conditioned from an early age to look to external authorities for guidance on what to do and how to live. At first, it's our parents and school teachers that shape the way we think and relate to the world. Later on, we might turn to the gurus, experts, and thought leaders that crowd the spiritual and self-help marketplace to fill the role of wise elder in our life. In traditional indigenous societies, there are coming-of-age rituals and mentor relationships in place to help a young person reach emotional and spiritual maturity, become an adult, and later an elder. I believe that much of the West's interest in plant medicine shamanism is a response to a deep longing for initiation and rites of passage, the soul's call to grow up and grow wise. In the plant medicine world, I hear things like, ayahuasca is a stern but loving mother, or ayahuasca told me to stop eating meat all the time, which makes me wonder, Are we so hungry for the nurturing mother figure and wise elder in our culture that we transfer these qualities on to ayahuasca? Is it really mother ayahuasca telling us what to do and how to live? Or is ayahuasca simply helping us to see something that we already know deep down inside? Similar to the transference that occurs in the relationship between therapist and client, ayahuasca can become a surrogate for the mother teacher, or elder we never had. This can provide temporary relief from our longing, as it did for me, but at some point we need to find those qualities within ourselves if we want to be fully in our power. We need to awaken to our own inherent wisdom and inner authority. In my case, working with ayahuasca in an intentional way over a number of years served as a kind of protracted initiatory process that ultimately led me to discover that the answers that I'd been seeking were in me all along. I just needed help to see that and start to trust my own inner wisdom. Ayahuasca and other psychedelics are tools that can help quiet the judgmental and doubting voices in our head long enough to listen to the wisdom of our own heart. If we're able to drop our projections and disempowering beliefs for even a brief moment, we can see that the insight and guiding wisdom aren't downloads from out there, but are actually uploads from the heart. This revelation liberates us from always feeling like we need to look for answers outside of ourselves. The most any teacher can do is point us toward the truth, because they know that we need to find it ourselves. The wise ones want us to be free. They will let us walk the pathless path to truth alone, guided by our own inner teacher, the heart. Part 15. The Final Lesson In 2017, I taught yoga for a few months at the Temple of the Way of Light, 
an ayahuasca healing center outside of Iquitos, Peru. While there, I participated in a number of ceremonies with various Shipibo healers and formed a special bond with a maestro named Damian, a former school teacher from the Yucayali region. I stayed in a small thatched roof hut beside the maestro's house and would often hang out on their porch, smoking mapachos, chatting with them in my broken Spanish, and helping Damian dig sand flea eggs out of retreat participants' feet. Typical jungle stuff. In our time together, I learned that, like many indigenous shaman who have been exposed to Christianity through colonialism, he thought of Jesus Christ as a great teacher and healer. Since my time with the Santo Daimi Church, which is a syncretic mix of Christianity, spiritism, and shamanism, I'd also developed an appreciation for Christ's teachings. During one ceremony, when it came time for him to sing to me, I asked him if he would sing to Jesus. He leaned in, nodded his head, and said, Yeah! As he sang in a soaring nasal voice, I could hear references to Christ mixed into the Shipibo, and I was soon overwhelmed with a strong energy that forced me to lie down. I was plunged into complete darkness and felt like I was inside a great serpent, its skin undulating as it moved along an infinite path through space. I couldn't do anything but surrender to the experience and allow a deep energetic cleaning to take place. Electricity pulsed through my whole body and it felt like every cell was being restructured and calibrated. After some time, I was able to sit up again, and I was filled with a feeling of great love. I had the insight that this is what it feels like to love like Christ, expansive and all-inclusive, and that if we could all just love like this, it would be the complete end of our suffering. In that darshan of Christ, I learned that loving someone in spite of their faults is to forgive them completely. When someone says or does something hurtful, it's coming from their own pain, and they're just showing you what part of them needs to be loved. If we're able to see that, we can hold their pain with compassion and not take it personally. In my revelation, it was revealed that Love like Christ was the final lesson, because to love unconditionally is the most healing thing you can do. So, love people just like you love the ocean, the trees, the mountains, the sun. Love it all for how it is, not for how it might be. Love without conditions. It may seem an impossible aspiration, but that experience showed me what's possible if we can truly, as Jesus commanded, love thy neighbor as thyself. Of course, I don't always live up to this ideal, but my experience has given me something tangible to align to, which feels much more powerful than any spiritual doctrine. Part 16 waking up and growing up. There are two aspects to personal transformation that are equally important, waking up and growing up. Waking up starts with the recognition that we're not living life to our fullest potential and that we're suffering unnecessarily. For me, this was waking up to the fact that I was stuck in emotional and behavioral patterns that were causing conflict within myself and in my relationships. I could see that these patterns were causing me to react to things people said and did in a way that was creating a great deal of stress and anxiety for myself and others. I could also see how my attempt to manage that stress and anxiety through drinking and other behaviors was just adding to my problems. Being tired and hungover all the time made me more reactive and less able to handle the pressures and challenges of my job and personal life. My coping strategies were no longer working for me, and it was clear that I needed to find another way to live if I wanted to find happiness. 
Deep down, I knew that it was time to take control of my life and free myself from the patterns that had been running the show for too long. I needed to switch off autopilot and take the wheel, but I had no idea where to begin. Like many people who have had a wake-up call, I began to seek out ways to understand what was going on below the surface and causing all the turmoil in my life. And this search led to the experiences I've written about in this book, The kind of eureka moments I had in my early ayahuasca and yoga experiences can be, as they were for me, profoundly transformative. They can even create immediate shifts in how we think and behave, but they're not the end of the road. As I realized somewhere along the long and winding path of my healing journey, waking up was just the beginning of a much longer process that I've come to think of as growing up. My waking up experiences helped me to break through the protective defenses I'd constructed to deal with the pain of the trauma I'd experienced as a kid. Breaking through allowed me to reconnect with my true self, but it didn't cause all the thought and behavior patterns that I had developed in the wake of trauma to simply go away. I came to see that early on in my life, I had made an agreement with myself that I would keep people at a distance to avoid further hurt and betrayal. Over the years, I built a wall around myself, like a fortress protecting a vulnerable child king. Every defense mechanism, every avoidance tactic, every coping strategy was another brick in that wall. My awakening experiences may have briefly opened up an aperture and given me a glimpse of the freedom and potential for deep connection and peace that was possible, but it would take years to dismantle the wall, brick by brick. Every callous word that came out of my mouth, every emotional overreaction, every judgment and criticism was showing me just how much work I still needed to do. This is where ongoing psychological work comes in. After we've had a taste of freedom, we need to do the work of unraveling the stories we tell about ourselves and the world. We need to uncover the sources of our reactive patterns and coping strategies if we want that freedom to last. What I've found is that this is really a process of growing ourselves up, so that we're not perpetually repeating the patterns that were programmed early on in our childhood. Whether we learn them from our parents and family, or develop them to fit in with our schoolmates, these adaptations were helpful or even necessary for survival at a young age. But at a certain point, we need to release these old patterns in order to become more fully ourselves and find real intimacy, peace, and fulfillment in our adult lives. There are many ways to do the work of growing yourself up, and over the years I've explored many of them, from the work of Byron Katie, to cognitive behavioral therapy, to internal family systems, to body-centered psychotherapies like Hakomi and somatic experiencing. Most recently, I have been studying and practicing an approach developed by Dr. Gabor Mate, which elegantly synthesizes many of these modalities into something he calls compassionate inquiry. So if you're wondering how to integrate your awakening experience and truly transform your life, I encourage you to explore all the myriad tools now available and seek out an experienced guide to help you navigate the process, preferably someone who has had an awakening experience and done the work of growing themselves up. If you want to improve your relationship with your spouse or find a life partner, seek out a guide who is in a long-term relationship. If you want to learn how to be a better parent, find someone who has a good relationship with their kids. If you want to get along better with coworkers and find more fulfillment in your career, find someone who has been there and done that. A guide doesn't need to be a professional. It could be a trusted and caring friend who's simply been on their path a little longer than you. While the profound awakenings experienced through yoga, meditation, and psychedelics can offer us a taste of freedom and provide us with much-needed inspiration and hope, the bottom line is that we need to get our hands dirty and do the work of dismantling the walls that limit us, brick by crumbling brick. It's often uncomfortable and difficult work to face the fact that we've constructed our own prison, 
but it's also liberating and empowering. After all, who's better equipped to plot the escape from prison than the person who built it? Part 17. Some final words on the heart. I find it almost impossible to write about the spiritual heart without feeling like I'm taking something away from it or leaving something crucial out. I think it's because, for me, the experience of the heart exists in a space prior to thought, and all thoughts are made of words. The tangible, felt experience of the heart has a kind of primal aliveness that refuses to be fully captured by language. Any attempt to write about the heart seems to be an attempt to tame the wild life out of it. And yet, the poets, mystics, and yogis have struggled for millennia to communicate the truth of the heart. In the ecstasy of revelation, there's a desire to share it with the world, to say, look, God has been right here all along. Look no further. It's in the images of Christ opening his robes and pointing to his burning heart, or the monkey god Hanuman tearing open his chest to reveal his beloved Sita and Rama. What is the spiritual heart? We can't agree on where it is or what it looks like, but we all have a sense of something deeper inside each of us, a truth that lies beyond the mind. When we try to talk about the heart or the soul, perhaps we're just pointing to the living experience of our animal body, our wild nature, before it has been bound by labels and concepts. I think the best attempts to communicate the experience of the heart have been through poetry. The Persian mystic Rumi gets close when he says, Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, There is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Reality is a field that exists beyond mental constructs and their inherent duality. It is wild and untamed and full of such awesome intelligence and beauty that the mind shrinks in its presence. It's the vast, unknowable intelligence that forms our body, that breathes our breath, that beats our physical heart. Perhaps the greatest spiritual truth can be known by simply surrendering the mind to the intelligence of the body and breath, which is clearly the intelligence of nature, of the cosmos itself. What greater power could there be? And how could we possibly be separate from it? Our search for truth always seems to take us further from it. Because truth can never be fully grasped by the mind. It keeps on searching for something out of its reach, like a dog chasing its tail. For whatever reason, it seems the mind has a hard time accepting the simple truth that we are, as Mark Whitwell says, the power of the cosmos arising as pure intelligence and unspeakable beauty in harmony with the entire cosmos. So what are we to do? How do we free ourselves from the endless seeking for solutions to our self-made problems? The poet Mary Oliver offers this. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. What if the highest spiritual practice was to simply give your soft animal body what it loves? The body loves its breath, so breathe for the pure enjoyment of it. Dance for the sake of dancing. Sing for the sake of singing. If God is love, then any activity that brings you into direct contact with joy is a spiritual practice. The only prerequisite is to do it wholeheartedly. My teacher Mark would always say to people on his retreats, Stop looking and start living. The seeking is the problem. If I think back to when I was profoundly unhappy and suffering deeply and imagine how I would have reacted to hearing those words, I'm sure I would have said, Yeah, easy for you to say. I need to find a way out of this mess. It's been a long and winding road, often confusing and challenging, 
but I'm grateful for the time I spent searching because it led me to yoga, ayahuasca, and teachers like Mark. All along my healing journey, I've met incredible people and had so many magical experiences that have enriched my life and left an indelible imprint. I wouldn't trade it for a second. It's true what they say about it being all about the journey, but I figure maybe by sharing my experience, I can save you a little time and trouble. So while I won't tell you to stop searching, I will leave you with the simple advice that helped point me in the right direction. Come back to your breath, come back to your heart. Part 18. Life After Ayahuasca Psychedelic experience is only a glimpse of genuine mystical insight, but a glimpse which can be matured and deepened by the various ways of meditation in which drugs are no longer necessary or useful. When you get the message, hang up the phone. Alan Watts In the psychedelic community, ayahuasca is often referred to as the medicine, which suggests that it's a universal cure-all. And yet, many of the people who use that term take ayahuasca again and again, sometimes as frequently as once a month, sometimes even more. The question I'm left asking is, if it is truly a medicine, then wouldn't you stop needing it at some point? When evaluating the messages coming from the pro-ayahuasca community, It's important to consider that the most visible and fervent evangelists usually have a lot invested, personally and financially, in promoting ayahuasca as a true spiritual path and universal panacea. For them, the medicine is the solution for all of humanity's trouble, and the more people who take it, the better. I've heard many people in the ayahuasca world say, when presented with any kind of persistent illness, uncertainty, or confusion, that the answer is to drink more medicine. I think it's worth looking critically at these kind of messages. Consider that these are often people who have completely stepped out of mainstream society and restructured their entire lives around the medicine, organizing retreats, weekend ceremonies, and even opening healing centers of their own. Their status and livelihood depends on the acceptance of ayahuasca as a miracle cure, and they work hard to maintain an online persona that acts as a testament to ayahuasca's effectiveness. From them, we only hear about the benefits. Rarely do we hear about the negative outcomes that are also part of the ayahuasca story. Ayahuasca doesn't work for everyone, and sometimes it makes things worse. If you're considering working with ayahuasca or another psychedelic, do your research and weigh the potential benefits with the very real risks. Ask yourself if you've sincerely tried everything you can to support your health and well-being before venturing into the world of ayahuasca or other powerful plant medicines. The people who grow up around ayahuasca have a healthy fear of it for good reason. They know that ayahuasca can be used for both healing and harming, and that the plant medicine path is full of potential dangers. Working with ayahuasca is a serious decision and shouldn't be taken lightly. Historically, it was something that few people would take on, and those that did dedicated their life to it. The evangelists say that the reason ayahuasca has spread around the globe so quickly is because Mother Ayahuasca herself is on a desperate mission to raise the collective consciousness in time to save humanity and the planet. I think it's more likely due to Westerners hungry for spiritual experiences and sincerely looking for relief from the despair of modern life. If Ayahuasca is an advanced sentient intelligence, Would she really want us to develop a reliance on her to the point of potentially causing her own extinction? Reports suggest that this is already happening in the area around Iquitos, Peru, the hub of ayahuasca tourism. 
Mature ayahuasca vines are becoming harder to source, and the global market is driving prices up to the degree that local shaman can no longer afford to buy ayahuasca for their own use. It feels like we are approaching peak ayahuasca, and something's got to give. What it comes down to for me is this. Psychedelics can be a powerful tool on the path, but you can't rely on them forever. As the Buddhist parable says, once you've crossed the river, you need to leave the raft behind. Otherwise, it will just weigh you down. If any benefit beyond personal healing is to be gained from working with ayahuasca, I believe that we need to take what we've learned and reintegrate back into our home communities. If we truly want to change the societies that are making us sick, the solution isn't for more of us to set up shop as neo-shamans. What we really need are more open-minded and heart-centered lawyers, teachers, technologists, corporate leaders, and politicians who are still able to reintegrate and function within their home culture. Like personal change, societal change is an inside job. To paraphrase Zen philosopher and psychedelic icon Alan Watts, when you get the message, hang up the phone and get back to work. Take the insights from your ayahuasca visions and put them to work in your life back in the culture that you came from. Use the inspiration you gain to envision a new way of being in the world and work to make it a reality. Open your mind to a possibility for life after ayahuasca. If ayahuasca is, as the evangelists claim, a nurturing and caring mother spirit, then surely she would want nothing less than for her children to grow into strong, capable, independent, and self-sufficient adults who no longer need her in order to thrive. 